Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 660 with Chef Justin Brunson. All right, with excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Justin Brunson, my man. Justin, are you feeling unstoppable today? Oh, man, uh, we are getting ready to open up uh, our sixth concept this week, so we are uh, are in the groove right now, for sure. Dude, I cannot wait to find out how you're handling it, but uh, just to set the (laughs) listeners up a little bit more, after attending the Scottsdale Le Cordon Bleu College of Culinary Arts, Chef Justin Brunson scored an internship with Chef Michael, say his name for me one more time. Di Maria. Di Maria. And Michael's at the Citadel. In 2004, Brunson made the move to Denver, Colorado, where over the next four years, he worked with key mentors Richard Sandoval, Frank Bonanno, and Alex Seidel. Uh, did I say that right? Yeah, Seidel. Seidel, thank you very much. I'm horrible with names. In 2008, Brunson opened a masterpiece delicatessen to rate reviews. The delicatessen was followed by Old Major in 2013, which won numerous best of awards. Uh, these hits were followed by Culture Meat and Cheese in 2016. River Bear in 2018, as well as Royal Rooster in 2018, and you have some. You said three new concepts going in the works right now. Just <laughs> kind of set us up. What, what's what's in the works currently? Uh, so uh, this Friday we open up in Rosetta Hall, uh, up in Boulder. It's our first Boulder location. We are opening up a concept called Wholesome Foods. It's going to be kind of a greatest hits of uh, some of our sandwiches and meat and cheese boards. Uh, we're really stoked to come up to uh, Boulder, our first Boulder location. We couldn't ask for better partners than we have here at Rosetta Hall so it's pretty awesome yeah and I've definitely seen a trend um just in the last the, mo- the more recent concepts uh you're definitely seem to be looking at food halls uh, and you're, you seem really interested in food <laughs> halls so I'm sure we'll unpackage that as the the conversation unfolds yeah. but um let's get that motivational inspirational <laughs> ball rolling with a success quarter mantra what do you got for us oh man uh just go. Just go. Just go. Dude, no. I love it. Dude, you know, we're only here for a little bit. You might as well do something while you're here. Ain't so. nothing to it but to do it is yeah, what I like to say. Totally. Right? Awesome Fish stuff, has man. this little song, Antelope, that kind of uh, inspires me. So listen to that sometime. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to listen to it on my way to Cal- yeah. uh, California. I leave tonight. So I have something to listen to. I'm pumped. So where does it make sense to start telling your story, man? Where, where, does, it all, <laughs> where does it all start? Uh, I don't know, man. It starts definitely uh, as a child in Iowa. Uh, growing up in a farming community, uh, lots of hunting and fishing and foraging and gardening. And food is just, I mean, there's not a lot to do in Iowa. Food is such a huge part of who we are there. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, grew up on a farm. Always had all this, you know, my grandma was a great cook. You know, we hunted and fished, foraged. I mean, like the mushrooms I, should I, be, I right? buy yeah. $40 a pound, pay $40 a pound for here. I could go in my backyard <laughs> and pick up, you know, five pounds of them. No yeah, problem. I hear you. You know, and then, uh, you know, just being in those farming communities, food was such an important piece of, uh, you know, who who I am as an Iowan and just as a person. Awesome, man. I love it. So it sounds like the journey starts with a passion for food. You fell in love with food. Uh, <laughs> and, and were you working in restaurants in high school, or was it straight uh, well, from the, the farm to the, the kitchen <laughs> in, in uh, college? I've always been a fat kid. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I've always been eating a lot. My grandma was a badass cook. Um, so I got a lot of it, uh, my passion of food from her and just being around that. And, you know, I, I worked uh, I actually worked at a plant farm uh, with a huge produce garden in high school. Uh, so that got me into like the whole canning and, f- uh, you know, um, preserving of foods and growing. Like, I mean, we had a two acre vegetable garden. It was yeah. insane. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's really where it came from. Just being my, my inner fat kid is very large. So you knew you were going to go to culinary school. You kind of, um, from I early- didn't no? actually, man, okay. I went to regular college and got kicked out. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. I'm, the bad, I'm a bad kid. How long did you last? Oh, I think it was two months. It's amazing. I didn't kick. I think I had a 1.19 in my first semester in college. Yeah. So they I asked me to did. leave within like two months of being there. <laughs> so, that really made my mom and dad happy. <laughs> so how much time <laughs> did you submit in between uh, figuring out your new path? Uh, you know, I actually went back and worked at a feed warehouse, you okay. know, unloading uh, semi trailers full of animal feed and Man, that job sucked. So when did you? <laughs> when did the conversation of like maybe I should go to culinary school come? You know, I probably worked in that feed warehouse for like a year, and I was like, man, I gotta do something with my life. I'm gonna get stuck in Iowa, <laughs> uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, as a young person, you want to go you experience wanna, yeah, new things yeah. and do new things. And you know, I always, you know, it's really weird. Like the Food Network is a huge reason that I fell in love with food. Like back in the day when it was like Bobby Flay and Emerald, and before Mario was a total scumbag. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, they had all those awesome shows on there. You know, it was just cool to watch them. 
yeah. watch them, uh, you know, grow. And it really got me into food. And nobody in Iowa was cooking that kind of food, you know. Like, I never had sushi till I was 21 years old. So what was it like when you got to culinary school? Man, it was fun, man. My eyes opened up. Uh, I was seeing all these cool new ingredients and techniques. And, uh, I mean, I'm a bit of a pirate. So the ki- kitchen restaurant atmosphere was really good for <laughs> <laughs> me and my right, lifestyle yeah. at, at, as a 21 year old man <laughs> yeah, so, so 21's a good i think it's good time it's good to take some time between you know high school and culinary yeah. school right? everybody that i've come across that went into culinary school like 21 22 23 24 always did way better they always almost at grad i don't know yeah, where you i was on the class. dean's list man. nice man <laughs> nice but i mean did, did you take it more seriously do you, do you think there was more time to kind of mature and, and to make you know your second time around college you want to do it right this time yeah i don't man to me personally i was just into it i wasn't really into regular school you know yeah, it wasn't my thing man i was into chasing girls around smoking weed <laughs> you know like that's what i did the first go around and the second go around i was just focused on you know becoming the best cook yeah. yeah, I could be, you know. I mean, I had been professionally cooking on and off through high school, too, really. I yeah. mean, worked at catering companies and stuff, but it was really what I found what I wanted to do. And, man, I just got the bug, man. It was awesome. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, and it's, it's just like any school. It's what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. And, yeah. Uh, it was just a good environment for a delinquent no. like me. Do you think do you, if you could do it all over again, do you think you'd go back to culinary school or do you think it would have come up a different way? Uh, I wouldn't change how I've done anything. Yeah, it hasn't been the easiest road or the best road, or but I've made every mistake possible, and I, I'm pretty good at learning from my mistakes. Uh, thank God. Nice. So, <laughs> um, take us through that first uh, opportunity, your first internship. Oh man, it was cool. I, I just got out of school, and everybody was talking about this best restaurant in Scottsdale, Michael's at the Citadel. You know, I went up there, and the chefs. I walked into this. You know, it was a fine dining restaurant. And I was like, oh man, it's gonna be super quiet and like. You know, like everybody's head down. I walk in, they're playing black metal. <laughs> everybody's covered in tattoos. And I was just like, whoa, I didn't expect it to be like this. You know, uh, and just, uh, you know, Michael DiMaria is, uh, he's a godfather uh, of, of, of American cookery as far as I'm concerned. There's so many amazing chefs that came through that kitchen. Uh, and he was all about techniques and learning techniques. And you learn these techniques, you can take those techniques and do absolutely anything with them. Give me some more about what you learned from Michael, Chef Michael, yeah, uh, as far as I how mean, he taught this technique, his, the way he, pre- he presented himself, the way he taught others. like Yeah, all well, stuff. he was uh, the old guard for sure. So a lot of screaming and yelling and throwing shit and violence. and uh, uh, But also... Uh, very creative and passionate and beautiful man, uh, but that's the old guard chef. Uh, what are the biggest lessons you learned from him? Man, uh, I mean, just respect of food, respect of, you know, techniques of how to cook, just simple stuff like how to sear a scallop properly. Yeah. You know, how to make a beurre blanc sauce, sti- how to make a demi glace sauce, you know, uh, you know, um, how to, you know, what to do and what not to do, too. You know, like this new school, that old school guard doesn't work anymore. You can't. It doesn't work like that. There's no yelling and screaming in kitchens anymore. How did he teach you to respect food? What was his way of delivering that message? Oh, man, he was real aggressive about some stuff, man. I remember he had this he had this whole cooking studio uh, in it, and he was like, here, roast these peppers and uh, peel them for me and bring them back to me. And, of course, being a dumb kid, I just forgot about them. And I, <laughs> I pulled them out of the oven. I pulled them out of the ovens, and the, the chef looked at me, the other, the actually executive chef, not Michael, because he had an executive chef and a sous chef, and t- yeah. two sous chefs at that time. They're like, oh, oh, you're, oh, you're dead. <laughs> and I run to the walk-in, you know, and there's uh, there was no more bell peppers. So I ran across the street to AJ's, which is this upscale market down there, bought some on my own money, <laughs> you know, just like, you know, just, uh, just, you know, he just, it was very, it was a very important important thing to him to have be perfect on everything you do in each technique and each step and uh you know and just treat food with uh respect you know yeah uh he might have been even a little on psycho end about it but i'm really glad i grew up with that because that works left an impression right (laughs) yeah i mean yeah it definitely left uh left some fear and fear can be a good thing sometimes any other big lessons you learned from this man man i mean i learned everything i know about cooking and work were, you know just like uh, I guess like working in a kitchen and the respect and how to move and what to do I mean everything I learned it came from that kitchen yeah you know? awesome stuff yeah. um, any I want I feel like there's one more nugget I can pull from this experience what about how to be not so much like the details and how to do things but the way you show up as a professional yeah and present yourself can you get into yeah, that yeah totally I mean definitely showing up as a, 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 prof- a professional being respectful um, you know, r- the respect for our craft, mm. you know, like you would never see anybody do anything 
even borderline there because you might lose your life, you know? Like, <laughs> um, he, and it's just his intenseness, man. It was intense, you know? You hear about these crazy fresh French chefs in France where it's just like screaming. Like, that's how I grew up here in America. Yeah, well, it kind of reminds me I had um, from uh, Johnny Caraba from Caraba's Italian Girl yeah. on the show, right? And uh, talking to Johnny, um, he, he put this emphasis on um, enthusiasm. Right, yeah. like you got to do everything with enthusiasm. Sometimes enthusiasm translates into like extremism, like but that that enthusiasm for what you do, that energy lifts everybody up around you. Right? Yeah. Would you say that was happening in this situation? Oh, dude, it, it totally was. And just you know, like all these crazy ingredients that he was bringing in there, I'd never seen this stuff before. You know, I'm a farm yeah. kid from Iowa, so we're getting stuff from all over the coast. And just, like, the enthusiasm that he brought to the kitchen and the respect for the food and yeah. all that stuff. I, I love just, it. It's, I, it's, I still try to put it in these kids today, uh, just in a kinder, more gentle way. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to move this mic. I think we can get a little closer for you. There All you right, go. cool. Um, so when was it time to move um, away from this internship? Did you ever, were you there full time or was yeah, it just Yeah, I actually, no, I did an internship, got hired on. I nice. ran his lunch program uh, and worked there for about three years. Uh Two and a half, you know, two and a half, three years before, I was just like, screw Scottsdale. It's yeah. Hot. So what was what was the reason for the move? It's hot. It's like hell down there, <laughs> man. I'm I'm a kid from Iowa. I'm a big fat ginger kid. I don't want to be somewhere where it's 120 you, degrees. That's, that was horrible to me, you know. Uh, and Colorado's always had this uh, special place in my heart. I mean, the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, it's uh, gorgeous up here. Yeah, it's I mean, it's a pretty special place. Yeah. So how did you decide? Like when when you knew it was time to go to different pastures, not greener, but necessarily just different new new experiences, uh, cooler weather. How how did you decide where you were going to work in Colorado? What was that process? Uh, it was weird. I actually came up to go to a, uh, I think it was, it wasn't Dead & Co. at the time. It was one of the, one of the, one of the genres of Grateful Dead. Maybe it was Rat Dog. But I went to Red Rocks and I went to a show and I flew back. I packed my car up and drove up here. Nice. You know, I was like, guys, I'm getting out of here. Like, guys, this is, <laughs> I got to go that way. Yeah. You know, um, and then when I got into town, uh, there was this restaurant called Adega, and Adega was the hottest restaurant in Denver at the time. And I wanted to work there because it was like the big, you know. I worked there for a week. Me and Brian didn't get along very well. Okay. Uh, but he's still an amazing chef, and we're actually friends now. But uh, <laughs> I was in and out of that kitchen in a week. <laughs> nice. And I was just like, dude, I don't, I don't, we didn't, we didn't groove, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's a perfect, le perfect lesson when you're going to workplaces. <laughs> it's okay not to groove right it's okay yeah. not to groove don't put yourself through it like yeah were you fired or did you walk out uh we I, it was kind of a you know a i don't agreement? like you you don't like me you know you should it was definitely a mutual agreement and then i went and uh found richard sandoval we opened up zango together so how do you handle that situation because it's inevitable we're not going to love everybody we're put in front of uh, how do you handle that situation well, respectfully, I, I mean gracefully? We, i got through the stage and it was good and then i got in there that week and i was like man this sucks this isn't for me and you know, I think it's just I'll, I'll just be open and honest. Be like, hey, man, this isn't really working for me. And they're like, hey, this isn't working for us either. Yeah. Best of you know, but best now you're good friends. But I yeah. mean, think about what it would have been like if you stayed another month. Oh, man, it could have got bad. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you, how much money are they putting into you, right? Yeah. How much time are you wasting? Yeah. You got to be mindful of this stuff, yeah. right? No, 100 percent. I think they respected that. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, if you, if you get yourself in a situation where you're just not happy, you know, uh, communicate, communicate, man. The truth is the You're best. You're a great communicator. Yeah. I've noticed that even today when I was, I got here, we had a little miscommunication with, um, uh, where to, to, to meet up. And, uh, I'm, I, I got here and, um, you're like, where do you want to do this? And you, you're like, just tell me exactly what you need. And I was like, I don't want to be inconvenient. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, just tell me what you need. And I was like, all right. Yeah, well, but sometimes it, people take that directness as a negativity thing too. And it's just like, no, just throw it all on the table. Let's figure it out. Exactly. The, the faster we can get this communication done, the faster we can get back to work. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So uh, how did you settle on the next spot? Uh, you, uh, so Richard Sandoval, huge name in the culinary world, man. Uh, I've always, uh, you know, I, I, at Michael's it was very uh, French technique, American, Mediterranean style food. Um, and then there was this cool new concept that just opened up Zango in Denver and it was Asian Latin fusion, which was a huge thing 16 years ago in the United States. Huge name like Richard Sandoval on it. I wanted to work there. I wanted to learn some new flavors, some new techniques. Um, it was cool, I started off as a cook there uh my troy guard was actually the executive chef there at the time okay. and uh within three weeks i was the executive sous chef there Jesus. Uh, <laughs> at 23 years old so, so how did you climb so fast uh i mean i i think well i just came from a different uh uh you know coming from michael's at the citadel it was i was ready to cook i got new great techniques uh 
I've always been a le- I mean, captain of the football team when I was a kid and shit too. So I, hear you. Uh, I, I, I don't really. Li- I like to lead people, mm-hmm. uh, and I just natural born leader and great, great hard work, willing to put the hours in and uh, good solid foundation of yeah. cooking techniques. So as a, as a young green cook coming into the industry, trying to like really learn and evolve, how are you choosing where you're going to be? How are you deciding? I mean, you is go, it the food? Is it the is it the the reputation of the chef? Like what? what, yeah, what was I more important? I think you want to go find somewhere where the technique is super sound. No shortcuts. I mean, the hardest place for you to work at as a young cook is the best place for you to work at. Okay. Like, I, I would, I'd never wanted a job where, like, oh, I want to do this the easier way. I've always wanted to do stuff the harder, yeah. the hardest way possible, mm. you know, because the hardest way possible is always the best way. Yeah. And what, what ways did Chef uh, Richard uh, Sandoval, I'm going to say his name wrong. Yeah. I know I am. Sandoval. Sandoval, thank you so much. Um, what what did he teach you about how to be? What, what, Man, I learned a lot about management there. Okay, that was like my what? first big management gig uh, as a 23 year old person i was a uh, s- uh, second command of a 150 person staff what didn't you know about management going into that, that oh you man while you're there? that you shouldn't be a dick to everybody were I you mean, a dick to oh people? man i was a hot head 23 year old <laughs> kid you know how'd you like, find out it wasn't the right th- way to be man you, you know you just you just live life and you learn from your mistakes and you know you think about who you want to be and what you want to be remembered as yeah and, and that's not what you want to be remembered as so you know? how long did it take you to to, to yeah, make that recognition it, and, and i to mean it took you know probably six months you know yeah. it was tons of stress you know huge restaurant we were there was i mean we were doing hundred thousand dollar weeks at the time it was Jeez. super i mean tickets i mean tickets down to the floor and back like as busy as a restaurant could possibly yeah. be you know so doing that trying to learn how to manage the staff and become a, a real manager uh of people and being artistic and putting out sick food still and still learning and growing. It, it was just, it was a lot for a 23 year old kid, but yeah, I loved I it. Bet. And I like to be, um, if what you're doing isn't hard, you're not doing the right thing. You mm. know, like if you're just on easy street, I mean, it's, it's just, that's not, that's not a good way to live, man. No like, pain, no gain. Yeah, as they I, say, I, like, right? I, I mean, I've de- I feel like I definitely a little bit different than most people. I'd like to be, uh, <laughs> a little stressed out all the time. Yeah, well, but going back to this <laughs> management thing, was there like a straw that broke the camel's back where like you kind of had an awakening of I need to change my ways, or was it just a gradual no, progression man, of like I mean, I'm a pulling of, out? Bit of a hippie kid, I, <laughs> I, I am. I, you know, I believe in being good family and taking care of people around you, and it was just like, man, I'm turning into my fucking dad. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to do, you know. Uh, so you know, I just take a step back and deep breath, and you know look relook at situations you know one of the best things that troy guard was the executive chef there at the time and then you know like i grew up in a kitchen where you just told somebody to do something yeah. do this do that do it now command and do control. it fast yeah right and like he taught me this little one little thing and i still use it i teach it to everybody hey will you do this for me Ooh, what's man, the power in that man it just it, you know it's just like you know instead of do this will you do this for me we do me a favor and do this for me you say that to somebody ten times or do this, you're gonna get a way better response yeah. a thousand times. And Troy guy Troy Guard taught me that and I think Roy Yamaguchi taught him that because he worked for Roy Yamaguchi, he ran his restaurants in Hawaii for okay. a while. So, but uh, I mean, you're instantly just adding a couple of little words, words on the end of that. You, know, you, right? you go from demanding to asking, asking, yeah. you know, and it's amazing what words can do. The yeah. power of, of and, words, you know. And as a, you know, I learn more about people and management. You're gonna the bottoms coming out. <laughs> uh, sorry managing uh, <laughs> while recording <laughs> you lose them all. Them all. i love it um yeah so uh yeah just you know learning people and learning more about humans just as you become an adult you know that was yeah. i mean shit that was six 17 years ago yeah we learned yeah, I mean, yeah i was re- 23 i'm 40 now right this i mean <laughs> this this industry and all i think all business really comes down to relationships yeah. and how to man- manage relationships i don't right? care if you're it's a it's it's, 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 a, it's a, my cisco rep or my sh- it's a relationship thing. Yeah. They all have the same stuff. Who's going to have the best relationship? Exactly. And that's actually kind of p- p- part of the thing we do at River Bear with our sales team. It's all about relationships. You know, people can buy bacon from anybody, deli meats from anybody. Yeah. Why they are going to buy it from us? Well, they're local and better than all the rest of them, but this, the, the, we're going to work harder for them. We're going to be there for the relationships. When you see something wrong in somebody's restaurants, you're going to stop. You're going to pick up that piece of paper. You're going to do all this stuff. Yeah. Just putting that hospitality back I love in, it, man. into the – 
meat delivery business even sales business <laughs> i love it dude it's uh, that enlightened hospitality as danny meyer says yeah right? uh i always say myers it's danny meyer no Dan- s there yeah. uh so when was the time to move on from chef uh sandoval's place frank bonanano uh Bonano? man i was there for what a year and a half two years something like that it just it was uh it was a lot it was i wanted to get back into a little higher end food like i was used to cooking yeah. Um, I mean, I went from a super fine dining restaurant to a super busy, like, club, Tao, you know, type <laughs> restaurant, you know, Tao in New York City. Uh, and, man, I, I, my passion was definitely the more refined food, the better ingredients, the more local. Uh, and so that's when I searched out Frank Bonanno. Uh, you know, heard about him for years, you know, in front of Bon Appetit magazine. What was it about uh, Frank that attracted you to his restaurants and his uh, his he, Frank is all about quality. A uh, small independent restaurant, which I really I flourish in better. Yeah. It's better for me personally to do that. Um, so, you know, the real small 40, 50 seat restaurants, tight crews, open five days a week. You know, uh, it was really uh, like a culinary playland. Uh, you know, I worked, a st- I started off as cook there, worked a station, but my station was all, all the dishes that came off my station was my food. After I was there for like two weeks, they're like, "You, you got this. You can, you can put food on the menu." And That's I was like, awesome. I, I mean, that doesn't. What, what's the power of that? Uh, How did that make you feel knowing that you had like a piece of you on the menu? Oh man, it's. I mean, as a young chef, that's what you done. You got a raging boner to you know <laughs> get your food out there. You know, um, you know, it's just awesome to uh, to learn. You know, you're you're learning. You know, like you're learning. You're pushing, but you're. You're always more passionate about your own stuff, right? Yeah, but how did it make you feel to know that I was your great, stuff that was people good loved enough? it? Yeah, yeah, it was awesome, man. It was it was very inspiring and great. I've had a lot of dishes on the menu over at, at Zango and stuff too, but uh, this was definitely more my comfort you, zone. You controlled man. it. You owned yeah, that portion. Yeah, you know, menu. and I love Italian food. I looked at worked at Luca Dea Italian. I love Italian food. You man. knew my last name meant the hunter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, we had a charcuterie program. There's butchery going on, and we're making sausages nice. and pot. All the pasta was handmade. So is, is this where the, like, the passion for uh, charcuterie and meats really started to swell in you? Yeah, definitely. Nice. It definitely, man. That was definitely where, uh, I mean, other than being a kid hunting and butchering all of our own deer and making our stuff back home, this is kind of like, oh, wow, I can kind of take what I learned as a kid and move it forward as an adult in my career. And, uh, uh, you know, and I just love Italian food. Who doesn't love Italian yeah. food? You know, just simple, f- beautiful flavors. So I'm curious uh, – being surrounded in this type of atmosphere, working with like doing with meats and Italian food, is this kind of what? Is this when like the vision for your own restaurant started to come into frame, or did it? Did you already have it at this point? Man, so I was we were I was working there. My roommate was on my partner at Masterpiece Deli too. He was doing the pasta. I was I was uh, working grill, up in, uh, sous chef working grill there, and uh, it was like, uh, fuck, man, we can do this for him. We can do this for ourselves. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I was like, because the, t- the year now is 2006. You're two years away from when you opened your own place. So yeah. like, the conversation must have started to, yeah. to happen around this yeah, point. Yeah, we were roommates and we were, you know, started, you know, talking about, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? And we're like, man, Denver doesn't have a great sandwich shop. Yeah. It has sandwich shops that this is sandwich is good here, but there wasn't one where it's like, damn, all the sandwiches at that one spot, they're all fire. And yeah. I want to go there. Like, I crave those. Dude, I'm going to probably swing by uh, the deli on my way back for it because I have a 16-hour drive, so I'm going to get some oh, sandwiches yeah, for the road. Oh, yeah, totally. You <laughs> definitely should get some sandwiches for the road, bro. Yeah, man. I'll but probably feed you before you leave here today, I'll, I won't too. stop you. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. So, uh, thank you. Uh, so, we haven't really pulled out a nugget from Frank that – you know, a lesson on leadership, a lesson on management, a, les- a lesson on business operations. Give me something, something solid. And I can pause here real quick if you need to. No, you're good. Okay, give me, give me something solid. Uh, about Frank. Yeah. And I, fr- Frank really uh, taught me about the independent restaurant tour and family in a restaurant. Um, Say that one, the independent restaurant tour. Like, uh, so I worked with Michael Demery, which was like this big, fancy, shiny monster, you know? And then Frank's restaurants were definitely more like mom and pop restaurants. His wife was in the restaurant working with us. Jacqueline was there. His kids were always around. Very family focused. You know, if somebody, if like somebody needed something off, Frank would go work their station. Yeah. You know, like, hey, Frank, I got this thing going on. I got He's like, okay, I'll work your station, you know. So uh, that to me was, was like, that's awesome. That's what I've always wanted was to be a independent, small business where there's high touch yeah right what's what's the power of high touch uh man it's just really i mean the source of community the sense of community uh the sense of family 
Uh, you think about a lot of the folks in the restaurant business, we're pirates, man. I mean, we value that, though. <laughs> Humans in general, we need it. Yeah. I think we undervalue the sense of family, the sense of belonging, the sense of tribe. You yeah. know, like these are my people. Yeah. Uh, and you get that in the small. Totally. We all worked. Know? You know what's funny? We all worked those five days a week. We were open five days a week. We hung out on the weekends. Yeah. Luca and Mizuno were right next to each other. We were just a big, happy family. We were, you know, we were, every night we'd get off work, we'd sit out by the dumpsters and drink beers together. You know, it was just, that was life. Robert. That was my life yeah. for three and a half, you know, three, three and a half years working with those That's guys. That's freaking awesome. So, um, what, so you did do a little bit of a tenure helping somebody open a restaurant, right? Before breaking off and doing your own thing? Weren't uh, you? No, I was building out Masterpiece when Alex asked me to help help him over at okay. fruition. He's like, I know you're just sitting on your couch while they build that <laughs> thing out, and I need help through the holidays. Yeah. So Alex worked for Frank, too. Uh, he ran Mizuna. Gotcha. I was over at Luca. We were really good Buddies. friends. He's like, man, I just need somebody I know that can come in here and keep their head down and work so I can get my first, you know, dream restaurant open. So fruition was it when he reached out to you, had they opened the doors yet or were they about to open the doors? Uh, I think I you know what? They, they had opened the doors and he had to let somebody go and just needed somebody okay. that he could call that day and be like, I need you for uh, two months. Yeah, well one it was thing, through the holidays. I was really curious because I mean one thing that I see a lot of successful restaurant tours do is they don't they go and in, in, in intentionally work for people who are opening before they open their own place. Yeah, no, it work. wasn't that situation. It was just. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you could work ten years in the industry yeah. and at be incredible at running a restaurant, uh, but opening are, a restaurant is a yeah. completely different beast. It's it is a it's a different it is a different beast, man. But I love it. It's like I don't know. It's like drugs, man. <laughs> <laughs> it is. There's something you're totally out of control. You're having a blast. The energy in the room's great. You know, people are stoked. There's all this new stuff nobody knows how to do anything it's all being done for the first time um it's it's i mean it's fun man yeah it's a, so it's a do buzz. You, did, you, did you pick anything up from this first opening I, mean, I know you weren't there to like set everything up and submit like to you know i did it man i was just there helping my friend out mm -hmm. keeping my head down you know but i mean i think there's uh, an under another underlying message here is that uh this mentality it's, it's those who are willing to help each other out oh those, totally you yeah. know like that stuff comes back around and it's not me versus them karma's a it's real thing man that, that <laughs> we mentality in this industry your comrades you know yeah. your, your, your band of brothers and sisters who are going through the same fight you're yeah. going through like like, if you can be there for them, you know, we, we don't expect to get it back, but, yeah. you know, it always comes back around. Did it ever come back around? Oh, man, I've, yeah, man, karma comes back <laughs> around and around yeah. and around and around, you know, so, you know, it's crazy. We've had plenty of people that worked for us at restaurants. We had to let them go. Some of them come back, you know, or they're like, oh, the grass is greener on their side, and they're, here they are three years later working with us again. Yeah. Uh, we've had a lot of, man, we've had employees, uh, I think my oldest employee's been with me for nine that years. That says something, man. Yeah, I mean, we, we're we not perfect, you know, and we've definitely gotten better as we've grown up over the last 12 years, of 13 years as a restaurant owner, you know? Yeah, we're going to get, let's, <laughs> let's get into that. Actually, we're going to take our first break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to get into the vision of your first concept and how you've grown and how you've gotten better and the lessons you've learned the hard way, maybe what you would have done if you got a second chance to go back around. I love it. Uh, one quick break. We'll be right back. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. We're back, and we're just about to get into you developing your first concept, the, the, the challenges you encountered, the successes you had, the failures you had in the process, or maybe there were no failures. Um, take us through it. What was it like? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, just the whole opening of the first place? Yeah, man. We fucked everything up, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you learn, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, that's how we learn as human beings. We make mistakes, and we learn from them, and we grow from them. Take us through the process. Oh, like, from, man. From like, you know, developing the business plan to finding the location to getting the capital to make it happen. Like, Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I mean... We had this idea. We left Frank's. We left Luca. We actually, there was a sh really divey bar called the Lancer Lounge, and we opened up in the back of that in the very beginning to proof of concept, right? Yeah. So uh, we were actually crushing it out of this crazy Dude. little dive bar in Denver. Lots of deliveries. People were loving it. And there was a buzz going around town. Uh, but we f knew we had to get out of there. We had to get it. We needed our own space. But that's perfect, dude. A lesson right there. I think people all the time, w especially people, if they have some money behind them, they go for their, their dream concept oh. out the gates. Yeah. And you got to test it. Proof of concept, right? Yeah. Pop-ups, right? Like Pop-ups. Try exactly. to find a restaurant that's closed a couple days mm -hmm. a week. Do a food truck. Or a bar a that doesn't have anything, right? Or a bar. Yeah, it's something like that. I mean, 
you gotta you gotta make sure that you know it's gonna work. So, what advice do you have for somebody who's looking for a space to do a pop up or? Man, I, you know, uh, there's so many cool things to do now. You can do pop ups with your friends and communities. Find a brewery to do it with, mm-hmm. or a, a winery, Fair, or, or, or something. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> So make creative. sure people like what you're going to put out, right? So when did you know, uh, like, I mean, obviously just are you looking, is there like a, a critical number or just a, a feeling you're getting yeah, that you got something? Feedback. Yeah. <laughs> you know, seeing what pe- if people want to come back and eat it if it's crav- craveable, you so know. So if you're seeing repeat returns, yeah. then that's your sign. And we, it was great. We opened up this bar. It was right between Mizuna and Luca. All the people around there were supporting us. And then the word was getting out. And then all these other chefs started coming in from all over town. And. We were delivering to all the tattoo shops yeah. and hair, hair salons, just making sandwiches. Plus, you, and people were going crazy over them, man. Yeah, now at this point, you have four years of presence within the industry yeah. within Denver. So you yeah. got friends. So, you know, People are going to support you. They're going to try to help you out, right? Yeah, man. It, it also helps. I used to be a weed dealer. So that, that, that helped back that in the day. <laughs> <I'm sure it laughs> Everybody knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> so when when you knew that you had something, when the when, when you tested the, the, the product and, and people liked it, when when did you know it was time to start looking for your own spot? Like, uh, well, we we needed like? to get out of the bar. The bar was in rough shape. The people there, it was a, it was a very rough situation. Yeah. Uh, so we knew we had to find our own location. We started looking around, and you know, we we found the Highlands neighborhood before it was the Highlands. Man, it was just us and Lola, and it was sketchy up there. And uh, but we we were being told that that was the next neighborhood that was going to pop, and we found this awesome building. And the building developer believed in me, Susan Powers. Uh, Say yeah. one more time. The building developer believed in me. Susan Powers okay. uh, was her name. Nah. What a thank you, Susan. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, we were nobodies. I mean, a little name coming with us, and we needed some money. We didn't have any money to get it open. She helped fund the, nice. the build out. I mean, we did that whole thing for 80000 bucks, which is, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, what was the uh, space? I mean, 8000 must have been a small, tight space. It's just, We're still in it. Yeah, it's it's been that been 900 yet. square feet. Perfect. We laid all the tiles. Or so. We did everything. $80,000. 80000 bucks. It's we hard to do that it. today. Oh, man. You can, <laughs> I mean, you could you could, might be able to do that today, but not very easily. Yes. Yeah, well, reflecting uh, back at this time, um, you said you did a lot. You, you said you fucked up a lot of shit. Like, give oh, me, get specific. What things would you have man. done differently? Oh, knowing well, what we you didn't know have now? any money to like market or really even have employees. So it was me and my partner and one other person and friends helping out. Like, and we went into it like fucking cowboys. Like we were, we were just. And the day we opened up the door, we did eleven hundred bucks just wow. opening the door. We didn't let it be like. You know, um, so, you know, we learned, you know, of course, I've been, tw- I was a 27 year old passionate fine dining chef of me in a sandwich shop. So I'm like, it just, and it's part of the reason it's such a great sandwich shop. But like now I look at it and I'm like, man, why I was such an eager, I, like I had to, for a coleslaw, I had to bring in whole heads of coleslaw <laughs> uh, and chop them up yeah. because it wasn't good enough out of a bag, you know, or, you know, like I was using Billy Eze salami, which is 20 four dollars a pound to make a sandwich with you know like but i mean it worked i mean i think the the concept was fine dining between bread right yeah that totally well that's yeah. yeah that's i mean that's what we my partner steve started calling he's like dude you're just taking all your greatest hits and put them in bread and that's I'm like, awesome yeah. oh man um, a lot of those flavor combinations you know just you know beautiful french brie cheese with you know cranberry honey with a nice smoked turkey uh you know and we had to make everything in house that was possible too you know and you know as we've grown a little bit I mean, thank God we have River Bear American Meats where we don't have to make all the meat in the house anymore Mm -hmm. because it was intense to do that in such a small space and be so busy. But, I mean, that's also what made that place so great, you know? Quality over quantity, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, well, there you get both. I mean, you got a big honking sandwich. (laughs) I mean, with a side, they're like 15 bucks, uh, which is a lot of money still for a sandwich, you know? When everybody told me, I told people I was going to open up a sandwich shop and they're going to be 12 13 bucks a piece. Everybody told me I was fucking crazy. They're like, <laughs> you can't sell a $12 sandwich in Denver. And here we are, 12 years later, still doing it. So, I mean, what was the lesson there? What's the lesson? Man, and, uh, follow your heart. Yeah. Do the right thing, you know? Don't, uh, I've always cooked the food you want to cook and then cost it out and charge that. You cook know, the don't, food you want to cook, the cost it out and charge that. Yeah. You know, there's no reason to, uh, shortcuts. Shortcut. You know, why, why, short but take a shortcut on something if you can just you know yeah, do think, it better i think the other lesson too is just charge what it's worth yeah you know like cost it out like if you yeah. like to, if it's quality 
Yeah. Then get your thirty percent food cost. Then get it. You know. Yeah. Get get your get your you know what what you are owed. You know? Yeah. Get totally. It. I mean, our pastrami sandwich is fifteen bucks, man. That's what it costs. It's fire pastrami it's, that we make here yeah, in Denver you know? with good beef and great bread, and it's just. You know, it's just a quality ingredient thing. Yeah, I love it. And, and I think there's a little bit of a unique selling proposition coming here because you were doing something that nobody else was doing, high-end, fine fine dining in b- b- between bread, right? So right. you stood out. You weren't another Jersey Mike's. No, you know, like no. You weren't a Subway. Like, you were a sandwich place, but, like, high scale. And you might not be appealing to everybody in that market, but in a city the size of Denver, which isn't the biggest city, but it's a big enough city, yeah. you're going to find your niche. You're going to find your people that yeah. want that. Right? We have. And, you know, the people that have found it, they're, I mean, we're – it's funny now that I mean it's 13 years, so I, it's in the na- and we're in a neighborhood restaurant yeah. too. So I saw people when they you, know, you could tell they would come in separate, and then you could tell like they hooked up the yeah. night before there and they're getting their breakfast sandwich. <laughs> the next thing you know, they're getting married, you know, and then they're pregnant. Now I'm feeding their kids. Yeah, you're like welcome. <laughs> I'm, I probably have like 50 couples. That's that I awesome. can tell that story with, that I chuckle about. So you had a five year run with the delicatessen before opening um, uh, Major. Yeah. Um, give me, what's your low of a low? Like the uh, 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 the biggest mistake, the biggest fuck up in that five years before focusing on the next project? I mean, we, you name it, we messed everything up. And give we me messed something specific because I, mean, I want to find out know. how you recovered from it. Um, I mean, because the good thing we were just busy. So when we did make a mistake, it fixed itself, you know, like, oh, God, that didn't work. So, you know, we, you know, uh, you know, we did we did open a masterpiece in another location that didn't work, and we well, had to close. Why it. didn't it work? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, part of the reason the land the rent was really high, and the landlord would let food trucks park right in front of our business, uh, and that really fucked us. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a million you know? and one different things that could happen. Yeah. Uh, to, that you know, w- when you have a concept that works in one location, you move it to another location. There's so many variables. You know. Yeah. Um. When it, I mean. The more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. You know, there's so many things that could happen. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So, anything you would have done differently? In Man, that I wouldn't years? change anything. I mean, we've <laughs> taken a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, what's lot the, of hits. What's the best thing you did? Let me ask you. In that five year period, what's what's the one thing that you did that you're like, yeah, that was the right move? Uh, work ninety hours a week, <laughs> and keep my head down, and right. try to keep my energy positive for the folks around me and the folks working with me okay uh just be positive man life's how too short how do you stay positive 90 hours a week how are you staying positive what's the conversation what's the that it's what's a buzz you know it's fun the, uh, you know simple things like hey man it's, i don't know how many people i see a week they're like man i went ate that masterpiece again man it's been there for a long time it's just yeah. as good as it ever was awesome. you know or you get a good compliment about a an employee or a manager you know it's pretty awesome right uh so that's our focusing you know, on the good on the good man we, it, it, i mean there's a lot of negatives that go on too you know uh but if you just keep positive and think it, about the good things and at the end uh, of the day you know, it's exactly what you want to do this is your dream this is what you wanted and you're yeah. doing it and i think we lose sight of that sometimes when shit gets tough yeah. you know like we're doing we're doing it yeah, like man. this is what i asked for i got it no <laughs> no make the best of it yeah totally yeah. i mean it's your shit sandwich build it how you want to <laughs> <laughs> uh what is um what is the, the significance, the weight in, in having presence and being there and in, in working side by side in the early days? What's the impact? Man, it's just so important to be on there to get the brand right, to get, you know, just, you know, the one of the things that's way different about our places and other places is how clean they are. Uh, our restaurants are fucking spotless. They man. are. Uh, our staff, we spend so much time on just like, guys, we, we if we're not cooking, we are cleaning and we got to keep everything clean. And it's just a respect thing for the the thing that makes us money, which is our restaurant equipment, the restaurant itself. Uh, I want that respect for the equipment, each other, the food, the customer. How do you? All of that. How do you make? Because everybody, we've all worked in restaurants. We, yeah. we hate cleaning. It's a yeah. bitch. How do you create a culture of that high standard? What is going Man, on? Just, I think it's all about the vibe when you're doing it. You know, at the end of the shift, you could be a wanker and just be all <laughs> pissed off, and you know, like, you know, or you could be like, cool. Let's get some beers and turn the music up and make this fun. <laughs> you know, like I mean, it's just vibe, man. It's the vibe you put out and uh, that your employees gather. And you definitely it, I, have an, en- an energy about yeah, you. Yeah, I've been sure. en- enough LSD in my life to know <laughs> about energy. There's no doubt about All that. All right. Uh, so when did you know it was time for Old Major? Like when was um, it? Like was it, how did knock? How did the opportunity come knocking? <laughs> um. I always, I mean, that was, I wanted to get back in the fine fine dining gig, you know? That's, it gets me, man. I love that service. I love the quality of products. 
I love the passion of the servers, the bartenders, uh, the cooks, uh, you know, really working with higher end ingredients. And, yeah. You know, and I, you know, was I'm young, still had something to prove. You know, yeah. So I you, feel like a lot of that's something to prove still. You okay. Know? Um, uh, so this is more for to, to, to see that you can operate at that level to see. If yeah. You can do, okay. Yeah. Like you know, can I can I do that or, you know, I know I want to. Can I? You know? It's a bit much bigger space too than your your <laughs> first restaurant. Uh, not yeah. massive. Well, what's the square footage on Old Major? Uh, we're uh, three thousand square feet over there. I mean, we opened up and we won Bon Appetit top fifty new restaurants in America yeah. and like. I mean that's a pretty cool thing to call a hey, mom. Yeah, hey, mom. A, yeah, yeah, I'm sure right? she's proud of you. So what was that transition like? I mean, you had experience working in these types of restaurants, so it wasn't like it was alien. No, to you. man, I was ready for it. I had yeah. the best staff in Denver. We had put together the best front of the house how staff. Did you pull this, how did you put it together? Oh uh, man, everybody just wanted to come. It was a thing. Like we were the first restaurant in Denver to bring the charcuterie game, big time, f- whole baking program, pastry program sick cocktail program it was very a new york city style restaurant do you think your years uh, of being a weed dealer helped you here when we're trying to get the <laughs> is that building the team did that play into it i don't maybe part of it i don't know uh, uh that all stopped before i started my own business okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um but i mean again like how how what was it about you and what uh, you were doing what, what what enabled you to i was just young team? and passionate i'm a super passionate person i was surrounded myself with a bunch of like-minded maniacs that were just willing to put the hour. I mean, we were working. I mean, I had hour, early, you know, hourly guys that were coming and put in six, eight hours a day for free just to be part of it, to mm-hmm. learn and grow. It was so cool. Everybody, it was out of this world, man. So it what, was. What was it about you and what you were doing that you think attracted people? How are you selling? Uh, I don't know, man. It just happened. People yeah. just came together. It was a bunch of like-minded friends. People were, you know, we're still all friends. You know, a lot of even after I had to let people go or they went their own way, here we are, you know, 10 years or, you know, seven years later, and we're still all friends, man. Yeah, it's awesome. You know, I got guys that used to work at that restaurant that uh, they're all over the country. I got guys in Hawaii, I got guys in New York City, you know, they got guys here in Denver that are running their own restaurants. Uh, it's really, I've always looked at it as a finishing restaurant for people. You yeah. know, like you come, you get finished, so you, you go from cook to chef or chef to owner. Uh, Bob Maitre D to owner, bartender to yeah. bar owner, you know. So it's definitely a finishing restaurant, very high standards, uh, uh, coming f- out of the kitchen and front of the house as well. Yeah, are you are you still just Brunson at this point, or have you become Brunson and Co? I don't know. We are Brunson and Co at this point. Man. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Uh-huh. I couldn't do. Uh, what's up, Andrew? Um, I couldn't do this without my team around me. That's why I was just like, you know. I mean, it's, we're still very small. There's so really only on our management team. There's only three of us. Wow! Uh, and we have six places. That's incredible. Yeah. So how do how what are you doing? What incentives are you providing? To Man, we pay a lot of money to folks, and we do <laughs> health insurance. Uh, you know, I rather take less money to provide more for my employee, um, and I can do that with all these concepts. You know, it's like I take a little bit here, a little bit there. We're taken care of now. Let's push the back the rest of it back into the employee. We were one of the first independent restaurant groups in Denver to bring the insurance uh, to the table. So we pay half, they pay half. Uh, it's great. You can go to the doctor when you're sick. Yeah, uh, that's right. pretty, pretty, pretty novel. Yeah. Uh, what, so any advice when pricing out insurance, anything to consider with somebody who wants to provide this, this service? I mean, uh, shop around, man. I, I think our, ours is pretty good. We, I got a guy that's it's 90 bucks out of our pocket, 90 bucks out of their pocket. You know, a really good insurance program, sixty hundred dollars. You know, sixty five hundred out of pocket max for yeah. the year. That's a pretty decent insurance uh, program, uh, and to be able to offer that to the people that want it is huge. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any hard lessons with old major? Anything that you know with a build out or be careful who you partner with. Okay. okay. <laughs> I had a partner there that was stealing from us in the beginning. We had to ex nay them out of it, uh, which oh. uh, which uh, it was I mean it was two hundred thousand bucks. What was the dynamic of the uh, the partnership? Was it front of house, back of house, or just just money? finance? Finance. Finance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Finance. Uh, what would you do today to pr- pr- protect yourself from? Oh happening? man, I would have been more on top of my numbers instead of trusting people. I was so busy in the kitchen just being a chef and trying to do that. I was letting them take care of the finances. Okay. That was stupid of me. Or at least, I mean, it's, it's one thing to let somebody take care of it, but it's another thing to not track it. Yeah, and you I know? wasn't, man. It really it was six months into it, and I was like, whoa, this I think is it's funny. You know, it's good. Eight it, months, I was like, get the hell out of here. You know, at here. the same time, I mean, you know, like every once in a while, we're going to get burnt. How many people yeah. have you come across in your time in the restaurant? Oh, industry? man, there's a bunch of scumbags and in the restaurant times, business. How many times, what percentage of the people that you've come across have burnt you? 
point zero zero one percent. Yeah, I mean, you pre- maybe two percent or yeah, one percent. Yeah, one percent. So it always if, if you're a good they person, sting, though, when it you, happens. yeah, you bust your ass, but you can't lose trust because I think it's yeah. your level of trust, your ability to trust that's probably got you to that point in the exactly, first place. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so um, so trust and track. Right, yeah, uh, trust and I think and the track. lesson is don't just trust, but yeah. trust and track. Yeah, um, I mean uh, that's what's. I mean, one of the coolest things about this food hall that we're going to be in, and these guys are oh, running the finances yeah, for all these first-time guys yeah. doing their thing. It's great for them. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, so what was what was your life looking like at this point? Um, you weren't at the delicatessen as much, I'm assuming. No, that's when I bought uh, Casey Taylor, my partner. He's my director of operations. He, I built him up. He was running masterpiece. I hopped over into old major and. Uh, we just started going for it. So when you say partner, are you bringing people on? Is it equity partnerships? Yeah, t- okay. uh, yeah, totally. I uh, I believe in uh, people that are going to be with me. Let's make them partner. And let's put some. You know, they don't even I, put money into it. It's I, all sweat <laughs> equity. Today, man, I think times are changing. I don't think you can be the best without having a partnership. I don't think that you can no. d- 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 divide and conquer the way you need to today to be competitive without yeah. partnerships. What do we need to know about partnerships? What is it about your partnerships that, that works so well? Man, I, I don't know. It's just, it's great to have uh, people to bounce stuff off of, uh, get another set of eyes on it. I mean, I'm not always I'm not always right. He's not always right. Between the two of us, we make a whole person. Yeah. You know? Which which part of the person are you? Which part of the person is he? Oh, I'm definitely uh, the uh, whimsical creative <laughs> type, and he's the one that makes it happen. Nice. So, yeah, so it takes both of us, and we put, both put each other I'm in I'm looking check. for my guy or girl to make it happen out there. If you guys are – I'm, I'm a Y guy to the nth degree. I need a how person. So yeah. if you're listening, I'm looking for help. Um, so – Real quick, um, so the next the next restaurant you guys decided to uh, open was Culture and Meat, correct? 2016. Yeah. What's happening three years into Old Major, where you where it's time to start focusing on other projects? Man, I, we I just got this great opportunity to be part of this new food hall in Denver uh, by this developer Ken Wolf, super cool guy, great. He's got a great reputation in Denver. And it was Central just, Market? Yeah, Denver Central Market. It was hard to say no to it. Yeah. It was hard to say no to it. And I walked in the building, and I was like, oh, man. I was really starting to work on River Bear at that time, too. And I'm like, well, it would be really cool to have this cool meat and cheese shop in this dank food hall marketplace in Denver. So, yeah, so I'm really interested in this portion of the conversation because this seems to be the evolution of your business model. It looks like you're really – you're really attracted to the, the food hall concept. Yeah, it's great, man. You can play pay employees. Uh, they're making twenty, you know, twenty some bucks an hour. So what to, was, to work in a kitchen, which is not. What was your comprehension of a food hall before he approached you? Was it on uh, your radar? I didn't really know anything about food halls. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't really know. You know. So, so what have you learned? Here. Teach us. Give us something. Give, <laughs> like, what are the pros? What are the cons? Uh, man, like, what, it's just cool. The sense of community. All I like. I, uh, the energy. The sense of community. Uh, learning, I mean, it's what a learning experience. Like, you know, we're in here with eight awesome chefs, right? Yeah. And nine awesome chefs in here. Yeah. You know, so cool. And then uh, just a sense of community, um, it's cool to uh, get people together uh, and creative thinking. And uh, the food halls are great. It takes a lot of stress off. You just got to worry about your little stall. So you operations. So operations we, so are you're easy. saying Logistically, uh, it, it's fewer moving parts. You're responsible for less. What exactly are you responsible for? Well, the uh, they're, they're all different, but, you know, like uh, a lot of the time it's like you bring your staff, your food, your idea, figure it out, make it happen. Um, I uh, I love it that my employees, I get to pay them a wage, a nice livable wage, and then there's like 5 to $7 an hour in tips on top of it so for you, each one of them. What so are you, 20-some bucks an hour to a cook is awesome. What are you doing awesome. to make sure that they're getting those tips? Like what things That's have you done their to, job to make sure they get those well, tips. Well, is there technology that you're implementing? Is there things that you're doing with the POS? Is there built-in options no, to tip it's, or anything it's, like that? No, it's all just kind of this, your typical, you know, tip or don't tip. Uh, some of them have, you know, a, a percent tip on them. Uh, and uh, it's just cool instead of that tip just going to the front of the house that it gets shared across the board from the counter help to the kitchen help uh, to me that's that is a forward thinking new re- I mean how many cooks make 20 some bucks an hour not many yeah <laughs> so yeah so some of the, b- the benefits I'm pulling are the fact that it's it's more streamlined as far as uh, operationals there's less things you're responsible for you're not it's, you're paying rent essentially right it's kind of yeah. like having a, a condo like you, you pay yeah. the fees yeah, exactly. and it gets taken care of like HOA takes care of all. less responsibilities yeah um, what about like operationally like what do the numbers look like I mean what are the prime costs like is it does it change because you have so many fewer no, I mean not really. By the time you get through, you know, your you know your rent, what would you usually pay in rent, dishwashers and marketing and chemicals and all that stuff, it's about the same. 
Okay. But then you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. And then what I really love about it, there, people love to come to these places. You yeah. know, you, the the millennials love them. Uh, it's a great spot for you can bring ten people. Everybody can get what they want. Everything's usually under fifteen bucks. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's a great place for families and friends and groups of people. And, I mean, some beautiful spaces too. I mean, the space we're sitting in yeah, right now. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Definitely one of the prettiest. Uh, I'll try to uh, get. I'll get some photo before we yeah. we, uh, we move on. Uh, anything that you didn't consider that kind of surprised you when it came to the food halls? Uh, man, I just didn't how busy a little stall like that <laughs> could be. <laughs> I mean, to do six thousand dollar day out of three hundred square feet is insane. Yeah, you know, absolutely insane. And we've done it a bunch of times. Uh, you know, and it just really comes back to that sense of community, all these awesome chefs and forward thinking people and being in great spaces. And it's just fun. It's just fun. I love it, man. So 2008 first restaurant, 2013 second restaurant, that's five years, third restaurant, three years after that. And now it's 2008. We actually opened another culture too. There's one uh, at the airport actually. Okay. So we got approached by the airport to put one out in the airport. We put one in there and it's just crushing it so i guess the point that i'm getting to is now you're you're, you're opening three restaurants in the next year yeah so um, <laughs> the, the the opening of the restaurants has gotten tighter how has your life changed how has your role in the the business changed with man i don't spend nearly as much time in the kitchen as i'd like to so how know? do you how do you maintain that presence in the kitchen that you you set this culture you create this yeah. culture you create these standards with your presence with your hustle right yeah so how you make our, our man we hire like-minded managers let them manage let them lead let them make mistakes we don't micromanage people i don't i'm not hiring anybody to micromanage what are you them. doing to find out they're like-minded are you just having a conversation is it gut feeling yeah i mean you i think you definitely can feel vibes off people uh and you know right away a lot of the, i mean we've got unburnt too we made some mistakes they're not right always fit. perfect right but uh you know we really really try to hire people that are on the same mental level as us as far as treating people and taking care of people uh you know, and how you treat people. And you yeah. get somebody in a sticky situation, you find out who they are real fast. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, we've been, a lot of it's been luck, but I think a lot of people want to work for us because we're pretty open and uh, we're pretty open and uh, like minded people as well. Awesome, man. Uh, anything we have not discussed up to this point? Any knowledge? Anything that, you know, you think you can, any less value you can add to the conversation? Uh, I don't know, man. I poked, I prodded, I got some good <laughs> stuff. But if there's anything else in there you think you can throw on the table? Now's uh, the time to get no, it. No, I, th- I think I'm good, man. I'm good. All right, I we. Did good. I like to wrap up every um, free flowing part of the conversation by asking all my guests. Uh, you know, the mission statement again is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. Right? Yeah. So, how have you transformed in your years as an owner since 2000? Oh man, well, so I've become today. a better person. How are you sure. a better person? Oh man, just being around people and seeing people in need and. Going through loss and uh, a lot of emotion put into it it's definitely made me uh, think about others and their situations and uh, just become more of a caring, uh, caring boss, to tell you mm. the truth. I yeah. love that. What's that look like? What's a caring boss look like? <laughs> Paint that picture. Uh, I don't know, man. I've, I've, I've you know, gotten a lot of phone calls late at night and help people out of jail or out of the hospital or uh, giving them length of money. And, uh, I think I saw something about you even going into the hospital. I don't know. Were you defending <laughs> somebody in a bar fight or something oh, no, like that? Oh, no. We or? actually just got <laughs> jumped uh, oh coming gosh. out of a bar. That was oh my gosh. absolutely frightening. Absolutely frightening. Well, uh, you know, worse. just all kind of, you know, just, you know, take care of the people around you that way you want to be treated and taken care of. Awesome. One more quick break. We're going to come back and bust out a fast speed round. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with with a paperwork nightmare again. All right, we're back. And the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Uh, Be good people, be kind to people. What is your biggest weakness? Being kind to people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is one question you ask or thing you look for during the interview process? Oh, man. I always ask somebody what was their worst work experience of the day and what they did about it. Okay. And yeah. what are you looking for? Man, just how you handle a shitty situation. Okay. It tells a lot about a person. I love it. Uh, what is one of your biggest challenges today? Finding good employees. How are you handling it? <laughs> uh by paying people well and making the best products we possibly can. Share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. A way to be, a way to act. Oh, man. 
clean your shoes. <laughs> What's that? Okay. <laughs> I just think it says a lot about a person how, you know, you got to cook with dirty shoes. It drives me crazy. <laughs> it just like you're not even willing to clean, polish up your own shoes and look tight. You're not going to you're, you're not going to do that on a plate. Yeah, I like it. I like <laughs> it. Uh, what's one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? So this is something that's common within your four walls. The way you go above and beyond to serve your guests. Man, we just put I push hospitality, 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 hospitality. It's like whatever we can do, man. And these people work really hard for the money. They can go spend it anywhere. What it, what, what are we going to do to make them come back and spend it with us? What is hospitality to you? Oh man. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's a, uh, you know, it's just treating people like family and I want people to feel like they're in my living room when they come into our restaurants. I love it. I love it. Uh, what is one book that will make us a better person or a restaurant? Owner? Oh fuck. I mean, kitchen confidential by Anthony Bourdain will always be my favorite culinary book that I've ever read. Was there a lesson from that book? A way that Man, it he was just uh, it just it, it would it just inspired me as a young chef to just go dive yeah. into it and not give a fuck. Yeah, that book is on audio. So if you head over to audibletrial.com slash unstoppable, I will get you that book for free. The first one's on un- restaurant unstoppable. And I don't know about you, man. Do you listen to audiobooks? Uh I don't I listen to Fish <laughs> and The I'm, Grateful Dead. Other than that, I'm at work. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but like audiobooks, in my opinion, are game changers. It's like the only way we're so busy in this industry. How else are you going to be able to, you know, learn? And yeah, we're not going to sit down and read a book at the end of the day, right? No. <laughs> so no. I, audiobook. I, 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 I work till like nine o'clock at night. I start at four three in the morning. <laughs> right. uh, what is one thing you feel restaurateurs don't do well enough or often enough? Take care of themselves. Okay, Take how, some time. Go see you, a shrink. How are you taking Stop care of drinking. yourself? Stop <laughs> drinking. <laughs> uh, I like to fly fish a lot. Mm. Uh, that's my thing, man. I used to party a lot and do all that shit. Now I send, spend a lot of time on the river. And, uh, you know, I think uh, everybody, uh, a good dose of therapy for everybody is a, a, um, a, a good thing. All right. This is the last question. It's a do. Actually, no, I, sk- I always skip this question. I don't know why. What is one piece of technology you've adopted within your four walls that's had a huge impact on operation? Something that's improved communication, efficiency, uh, profitability, anything along those lines that you can share with us? Oh, man. Uh I don't deal with any of the technology. I don't even have a computer, bro. <laughs> so hire somebody who's good at technology. Yeah, get a good get yeah, get get good people that understand that stuff. I'm not that guy. I'm a I'm a artesian for sure. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. Uh, okay, this is the last question. If you got the news, you'll be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants out the window, gone with your departure, with the exception of three things that you could leave behind, three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for your for your legacy and just for the good of humanity. What are those three things you know to be true? Uh, this shit. is a bitch of a question. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> um, shit. Do what you're going to say you're going to do. Do what you say you're going to do. Oh, Integrity. That's a, number that's a one. huge, huge thing. Uh, don't be late. Don't be late. Me too. <laughs> Make sure your fucking knives are sharp. <laughs> Make sure your fucking knives are sharp. I love it, man. This has been a great conversation, Justin. Uh, we like to wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. <laughs> who, who do you respect? And admire. Oh, uh, my brother sense. Amos Watts over okay. at Corita Restaurant in Boulder. Okay. Uh, Amos Watts is the man. Uh, Amos. <laughs> everybody go check out Corita in Boulder. And my buddy Amos is one of the best chefs in the country. So go eat some of his food. He's a, he's a badass. Amos, your, your name is on my list. I'm coming after you. Maybe not this trip, but the next time I'm in the area for sure. And uh, how can we connect if we want to join your team? Uh, maybe we want to come learn you know, from you. Uh, or maybe we have some questions about some something that came up in the story. Yeah, you can find us. Uh, I mean... Jobs at BrunsonConcepts.com. All uh, right. People are looking for work. Uh, it's a great uh, great way to get a hold of us. So uh, you can find us at uh, uh, Jobs at BrunsonConcepts.com. This is episode 660. Head over to RestaurantUnstoppable.com slash 660. I'll have a summary of today's discussion as well as a, uh, links to tools, services, or books, and as well as how to connect with the Brunson & Co. team if you want to get a job out here again just thank you so much my man for taking yeah, the time man. thanks sorry about our little communication no man Tiff. I'm, I'm just happy to be here it was awesome there is no questioning you are unstoppable awesome man thank you so Cheers. much